We are continuing with our series that we started last week in um, the book of Joshua. We are in year number 51 of our church, and we are kicking off the year with never stop. Live with unreasonable faith. Never stop. Live with unreasonable faith. I was thinking about the song that they opened the service with this morning. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You understand that if that's really going to be a reality in our lives, that that's going to require unreasonable faith? If we're going to serve the Lord with all of our heart, you know what God asks us to do? To love God and love others. How many of you would agree that loving God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself is going to require some unreasonable faith? Man, I think we saw an excellent example of unreasonable faith this morning in Winnie. 33 years, she's getting mad again, 33 years in the nursery, the nursery of all ministries too. Praise the Lord for that one more time. (laughs) Just to give you a a little bit of a snapshot of what that looks like and the unreasonable faith that's required, it was not that long ago, I think it was a few weeks ago, and uh, Winnie, she always stops by on her way out, she always talks to me, shakes my hand, tells me hi. And uh, this week she came and she's like, we had a lot of kids in the nursery this morning. She's like, it was like 18 kids. And she's like, I'll tell you right now. She said, there is a fine line between a long sermon and a hostage situation. (laughs) And I said, yes, ma'am. You can text me next time if we have that going on in the nursery. I don't know if it'll change anything because out of sight, out of mind. But no, anyway. Oh, my goodness. Just what... What an example, though. For 33 years, I just go back to that. That's just amazing. I I don't know. I I don't believe 33 years ago that when she started the nursery that she would think it would continue that long. But she just continued to serve God faithfully and do what God's placed in her heart. What an incredible example. Now, I think about all of our dads and moms and all of our parents here today, the, the parents that were up here dedicating their children, giving them back to the Lord. I think about All of us in here, our responsibility to the next generation, whether you're a grandparent, whether you're a mom or a dad, whether you whether whether you're just at an in-between stage of life, it doesn't matter. We all have a responsibility to the next generation. And if we're going to fully serve the Lord, it requires sacrifice. It requires taking up our cross and following Jesus. It requires giving and serving, forgiving bearing one another's burdens, loving your enemies as yourself. You understand that every single one of those words that I just mentioned is going to require us going beyond the limits of what is humanly possible. By the world's standards, all of those things are completely unreasonable what God's asking us to do. But when we step out by faith and when we trust him, we discover time and time again that with God truly all things are possible. And that's where we need to live our lives. This morning, the challenge that I have for all of you is this. Think big. Think big. We're going to be in Joshua 20 and 21 today, covering two chapters. All the land has been distributed to the 12 tribes, but there are a few finishing touches that need to be put on. There's a few details that have still not been addressed and taken care of. These are not minor, less important, insignificant details These two chapters that we're talking about this morning, they point us to the very heart of God, to who he is and to what he is all about. The challenge this morning is to think big. And the emphasis is on think. How many of you have one of these little gadgets right here, smartphone? These are are pretty incredible devices right here. I mean, they've completely changed everything about the way we do life and everything about the world. I think they're powerful tools. These things also have some dangerous components that we need to be aware of. There are all kinds of study out there about how these things have affected our critical thinking skills. They make us a little bit more shallow. They make us a, a, they, 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 they make us a little bit more lazy in our minds because we don't have to retain information and work at retaining it because everything is so readily available to us. But you know another major problem that sometimes we have with these things is they are just a big, giant distraction in life. 
If you go back to Joshua chapter 1, 8, you don't have to go there, but the way this book started, Joshua's challenging the children of Israel as they go into the promised land. And he says, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein. Our job is to take the truths of God's word, of who he is, how he wants us to live, and to meditate, to think on it, to dwell on it, to sit in it, to ponder it, to think about the big picture of it, to think about how it applies to our lives. And when we do that, and when we obey everything that it says, then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. Then thou shalt have good success. Do you want to be prosperous? Do you want to be successful in life? Do you want to be successful in the big things that really matter in shaping and pointing the next generation to Christ? I do. That requires us to think big. And that's what we're going to be looking at here this morning. So let's just jump right into it. The first thing that I want us to think about today is this. Think big picture. Think Big picture. All right, we're going to talk about chapter 20 in this first point. And we're talking about the cities of refuge. How many of you have heard of the cities of refuge before? Okay, some have, some have not. It's something that we don't talk about very often. All right, so cities of refuge. Look at what it says in verses 1 and 2. I want you to see right off the bat who is initiating all of this. Okay, so look at verse 1. It says, the who? The Lord also spake unto Joshua, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, Appoint out for you cities of refuge. Everybody read that last phrase with me. Whereof I spake unto you by the hand of Moses. All right, so as we've gone throughout these past eight chapters, from 13 through 21, we've seen often how people have approached Joshua asking for the land that was promised to them. Caleb came to him. The daughters of Zeliophad came to him. In chapter 21, the Levites are coming to him. But guess who comes to Joshua this time? The Lord. And he speaks to Joshua and he says, I want you to create the cities of refuge that I've already commanded and told Moses about. Well, what are these cities of refuge? What are they for? Look at verse 3. It says that the slayer that killeth any person unawares and unwittingly may flee thither, and they shall be your refuge from the avenger of blood. So to sum this up, you know what a city of refuge was for? A city of refuge was a place of asylum and a place of safety for a person who was guilty of unintentionally killing another person. Basically, someone who's, a man, someone who's guilty of manslaughter. Moses laid this out in Deuteronomy chapter 19, and he even gave us a very practical illustration. He said, imagine two men that are going out into the woods and they're going to chop down trees. All right, and one of the men, as he's swinging his axe back in the air, and as it's coming down, the axe head flies off, and it flies into the head of another man or into the body of another man, and it kills that person. That person is obviously not guilty of intentional murder, right? But it still does not change the fact that a man's life has been taken. And that comes with some very serious consequences. It was clearly not intentional, but still a man was dead. And as a result, based on Old Testament law, there would be an avenger of blood. We might know this person in a different term as a kinsman redeemer. You may be familiar with that term from the book of Ruth and the beautiful story of Boaz and Ruth, but there's, there's a whole lot to this kinsman redeemer and to this idea that, that God built into the whole nation of Israel. This was a male relative who was supposed to help a weaker relative in need or in danger. And a kinsman redeemer's job was to provide, to rescue, to redeem property, and to avenge. And in matters of Old Testament law, what do we know about the Old Testament law? In the Old Testament, it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a life for a life. And so a man's life is taken, there's going to be an avenger of blood. Here's the big picture. We're talking about thinking big picture. You know what the big picture is behind everything that we're talking about here in these cities of refuge? The sanctity of life. The sanctity of life. In this, when we think deeper and we think big to the heart of God, you see a clear picture of the value and the high regard that he puts on every single individual life. The person who died, for instance, to take the life of another person 
whether on purpose or not, is serious business. This is a person who's created in the image of God. Our legal system understands this. My son, Shepard. Shepard, stand up. No, I won't make you do that. He's 15 now. He doesn't want to stand up. My son, Shepard, turned 15 this week. He got his driver's permit. Pray for our family. We have another driver in the house. And uh, one of the things that we were talking about, and one of the things I like to remind even myself and all of us, we have a new subdivision that just came in down the street, and we often drive home through that subdivision. And I remind the boys, I remind myself often, it doesn't matter if you are texting, if you're driving too fast and a little kid comes running around the corner and you don't see him and you were to accidentally hit that child, and God forbid anything like this ever happened, but things like this do happen, right? Right? That wasn't in your heart, obviously, that wasn't something, but in those sense, if you're speeding or if you're texting and looking at your phone, if you're distracting, you're actually violating the law, and there's consequences that come along for things like that. Your life can be forever altered and forever changed, and so it's our responsibility to make sure that we're paying attention to all of those little details, all of those things. Life matters. This was a human being. This is a person that is created in the image and likeness of God, fearfully and wonderfully made with a never-to-die soul. Oh, I wish that our world could understand the value of every single life and the sanctity of life. Our world's completely missing the point that there are no mistakes. There aren't people that are born into the wrong bodies. We are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of a divine God and a creator, and we have a never-to-die soul, and we are loved more than we could ever possibly imagine and fathom look at verse six I, I want you to see again just the seriousness look at verse six it says and he shall dwell in that city until he stand before the congregation for judgment and until the death of the high priest that shall be in those days the city of refuge was a place of safety but it was also a prison they could go there for safety but numbers 27 elaborates on this even more and if the person that was guilty of manslaughter were to leave the city, he was open to the avenger of blood from that family. And if that avenger of blood came and took that man's life, it would be okay because he violated the bounds that God had put on him. And so inside the city of refuge, he could find mercy and safety and he could live. But his life is also forever altered because life matters and it's important and you just see the sanctity of life. But you also see it for the guilty person. A man without a murderer's heart should not suffer a murderer's punishment, right? Man, here in Joshua 20, God provides a place of refuge and safety. He tells Joshua, appoint six cities, three on the east side of the Jordan, three on the west side of the Jordan. He tells them to pave roads, to make it as easily accessible as possible, to strategically place them so that no man was ever far from safety, especially in a situation like this where an accident happened. No person was far from safety at all. You see God's heart and God's love, even for the person that is guilty of this unintentional death. In verses four and five, I won't read them, but it says once the person arrived in that city and the avenger arrived, once the person was tried, if he was found not guilty, he was granted safety, he was granted protection, the avenger of blood had to leave and go home, and that's God's way of providing, again, for a life, for a human being, for a soul that's valued. Here's the practical application from all of this. Never stop being merciful. Never stop being merciful. See people the way that God sees them. We've already seen the obvious example of mercy to the person in the family who lost a loved one, to the person who was guilty of the unintentional killing. In verse 9, look at that real quick. You see something else beautiful in these cities. These were the cities appointed for all the children of Israel. And everybody read those next four words. And for the stranger. God also created these for those who were born outside the nation of Israel, who saw God in the nation of Israel and came to Israel for refuge, for safety that's found in God. And these cities of refuge were places where they could live and dwell and be a part of God's people. You see the heart of God all over these nine verses that you could easily, quickly read right through. But there's a sign of even something greater to come. Go back to verse 6. Go back to verse 6. All right, let's see who's with me this morning, okay? Everybody awake and following along? The person had to stay in the cities of refuge until what? Until who died? 
the high priest. It was a place of prison, basically a place that you couldn't leave. It was a place of refuge, but you could not leave until the high priest died. He must stay, but not forever. The only ransom for the manslayer was the death of the high priest. The high priest represented the whole nation before God, particularly as the go-between between between God and man. And as the representative for the whole nation, his death would symbolically be the substitute. Life for life. So when the high priest, the representative of the nation dies and his life ends, the punishment for sin was met and it was paid for. Anybody see where this is going here this morning? I got a few people that are grinning and following along. You understand the whole Old Testament is just a shadow of things to come. And we had a great high priest and his name is Jesus Christ. And Hebrews 10 tells us that he went and he laid down his life once for all for us on the cross. And when we put our faith and trust in him, he doesn't just pay for our sins. He takes our sins away and we can go live in freedom and safety forever. Praise be to God for who he is. You see the mercy of God all over this, the big picture. Never stop being merciful. See people the way that God sees them. I want you to do something this morning. I want you to look all around you. Everybody right now, look all around you. Look at each other. Besides just your family, look at each other. Behind you, in front of you, to the right side of you, to the left side of you. You know who you're looking at here this morning? We are the church, the body of Christ. You know what John tells us? By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. You know where mercy starts? It starts right here with one another. It starts in our homes, but then it spreads out to the family of God, to the body of Christ that we are a part of. And you know what I want you to do? I want you to look around again. Look around, front of, behind you. Take it in. Listen, here's what I want you to ask yourself this morning. Who in this room do you need to serve? Who in this room do we need to serve? Who in this room do we need to give to? Who in this room do we need to step alongside and help bear their burdens? Who in this room do we need to forgive and let go of bitterness and things that have been eating away inside of us that are robbing us of our joy and robbing us of the blessings that God has. He calls us to forgive. The penalty for the sin has been paid for once and for all on the cross. Let it go. I hope there's no enemies in here that we have to love. But do you understand what we're saying this morning? Do you understand God has a merciful heart? And every single soul is valuable before God. And we're called to love one another. And it involves unreasonable faith because it's going to mean, well, I'm going to tell you what it's going to mean in the next point. So I'll save that one. Jump into the next one. Here's point number two. Think big idea. Think big picture. Think big idea. All right, turn to chapter 21. Here's the context of chapter 21. Look at verses 1 and 2. It says, Then came near the heads of the fathers of the Levites unto Eliezer the priest, and unto Joshua the son of Nun, and unto the heads of the fathers of the tribes of the children of Israel. And they spake unto them at Shiloh in the land of Canaan, saying, The Lord commanded by the hand of Moses to give us cities to dwell in with the suburbs thereof for our cattle. So what do we have? All of chapter 21 is the tribe of Levi. They are coming to Joshua and Eliezer. And if you've been following along as we've gone through the book of Joshua or you know anything about the Old Testament, you'll know that the tribe of Levi was not given an inheritance in the land. Their inheritance was God. But they still needed a place to live, right? And so God promised them that when they got to the land, they would be given cities. And you know what happens in all of Joshua chapter 21? Here we go. I'm going to tell you to cover the whole chapter. Joshua chapter 21, the tribe of Levi is given 48 cities that are dispersed throughout all 12 tribes of Israel. They're given their cities and their suburbs, and God takes care of them and provides for them in an unbelievable way. That's what chapter 21 is all about. But we're talking about thinking big, right? So what's the big idea here? Here's the big idea. The Levites are a living parable. The Levites are a living parable. A couple things I want you to know about the Levites. Number one, they were sojourners. 
They were sojourners. They are residents in a land that they did not own. They are a living parable and a reminder to every single one of us that this world is not our home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. You understand? We've sung that song. We've heard that song. This world is not our home. This world is temporary. The cities that they were given, you know what these cities were? They were bases of operation to better infiltrate the nation of Israel with the truth of God's word, which is why God left them in this world to begin with. You understand there is something much greater and bigger to live for than houses and lands and ourselves. The Levites are sojourners. <laughs> the Levites were specially chosen by God. God marked this tribe as his special representatives. He chose them. The Levites didn't do anything special to earn this. The Levites weren't even the firstborn of Jacob. They were somewhere, I think it was the third oldest. They were somewhere down the line a little bit. He wasn't even the, old, the oldest born, but symbolically, they became the firstborn for all the rest of the nation of Israel. And their job was to remind the people that it wasn't the land that was the real inheritance. The real inheritance is God himself. He is the treasure far greater than anything that this world could ever provide. Hey, the Levites were generously provide it for. You might be sitting there thinking, well, I got no inheritance in this land. I got nothing. No, they were generously provided for 48 cities, suburbs, all throughout the land. On top of that, all of the nation of Israel was commanded to tithe and to give their offerings. And you know what those tithes and offerings went to? Providing for the Levites and caring for them and meeting their needs so that they could accomplish what God left them in this world to do, which was to point the nation of Israel and to point the world to Christ. There's another thing about these Levites. They are our example. Their lives were to be lived in an exemplary way to remind us all that there wasn't anything extra special about the nation of Levi. They were just the, they were just the living parable about the tribe of Levi. They were just the reminder that all of us, it's all of our responsibilities to point people to salvation in Christ through the sacrificial system in the Old Testament, but through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross for us today, it was their job to point people to the glory of God through worship and praise. It was their people to point people to their job to point people to the truth of God's word and who He is and how obedience to God's word will open up the blessings of God being poured out on their lives. Does that sound familiar to any of us in here? That's all of our jobs. That's how we're supposed to live. So you know what the practical application is? Never stop letting go. Never stop letting go. The Bible's constantly calling us to a life of surrender. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. What does Jesus call us to do? If any man will follow me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow Jesus. If we're gonna follow the examples that the Levites were supposed to set and the idea, the big idea that God has for all of us, that we are a living parable to the rest of this world, it's going to require sacrifice. It's going to require surrender. It's going to require us letting go. Never stop letting go. You know what the big idea that God has for your life is for you to let go of it. I brought this morning a set of plans. I think this is an old master facility plan for our property here, but I just wanted to represent plans, your plans for your life. You all have them, right? We naturally think we get up, what do I wanna do? Where do I wanna go? How do I wanna get by through life? You know what God calls us to do? If we're gonna live out the parable that he called us to, if we're gonna live with unreasonable faith, we gotta let go of our plans, our dreams, our desires, what I want, what's important to me. And we gotta lay it all at the foot of the cross and say, God, it's no longer me. It's not what I want. I want what you want. I want the world to see you and the hope that's found in Jesus. I'm letting it go. I brought something else this morning. I brought a picture of a very, very good looking person. If you can't see the picture that well, just look right here, okay? This is a, this is a fine looking guy. That's a good breakfast too. That's right there printed this out this morning. You know what else we need to let go of? We need to let go of our selfish thinking. It's not about me. 
This is so hard. I, I don't know if we understand how selfish we really truly are by nature. But it's not about me. It's not about how I've been hurt. It's not about how I've been wronged. It's not about what I think is right, what I think is good, what I think is best. None of that stuff matters. Do you understand? We got to let go of everything that is focused and centered on me. And we got to give it to God and realize that we are chosen. We are special. We are a royal priesthood, a chosen generation. Earlier, I had you all looking around at each other. Do you understand that we are a part of a nation without borders and without passports that exist all around the world today? We are a nation that, does, that has an army that does not have weapons of mass destruction, but it has a God that has explosive resurrection power that can do something greater, which is transform lives and make them like Jesus Christ. That's what we are a part of. And the selfish thinking's got to go or else we'll never get to experience everything that God has and everything that God wants for us in our lives. It's not about me. I'm a part of something greater and something bigger. I'm a part of the kingdom of heaven. I'm headed to a home to be with Jesus for all of eternity. The pain and heartache and turmoil of this world is nothing. It's not going to last. Living for God will last for eternity. Stop thinking selfish. Get over yourself. I say that to me. If you think I'm passionate this morning, I'm saying that to me. I'm as guilty as the next person in here. Man, I can be a selfish thinker. We exist for something bigger. There's something else we need to let go of. This stuff right here. This isn't even mine. I didn't even have it. It just comes and goes. It's fleeting in my life. Thank you, Mayhew Brake, for your $100. I will use this wisely. Where's he at? There he is. He's always good for 100 I shouldn't tell people that. <laughs> Remember we were talking about the tithes and offerings that God used to provide for his people? My father-in-law used to say, anything that's alive costs something. It's true, right? I think that's a, a very bad. In order to advance the kingdom of heaven, it's going to cost something. Now, here's the beauty of all of this. My father, my heavenly father, he owns it all. Money is no obstacle for God. I want to reiterate that. God doesn't need, this $100 is nothing to God. It means nothing to him. He doesn't need it. He can do whatever he wants, however he wants, whenever he wants. But when we give he allows us to be a part of what he's doing in this world. That's our part. That's our freedom that we get in all of this. God's the one that's given us this to begin with, right? How can we be selfish with it? How can we just hoard God's blessings and take it to ourselves? What he wants us to do is he wants us to let it go, give it back to him, and understand that when we do, he opens the windows of heaven and he pours out blessings on our lives. It might be financial, it might be in health, it might be in a family that's, a, that's got a happiness and a joy that's serving the Lord. The point is he blesses when we let go. I, I never talk about giving in this church. <laughs> and I gotta confess, I gotta do a better job at that because if I don't talk about it and if I don't let you know that it's an important biblical concept, then I'm... I'm guilty of you missing out on a blessing. It's not that the church, God, again, God's going to do what he wants to do, but you get to be a part of that. And if this church is going to continue to advance and make a difference in this community and in this world for Christ, we got to be willing to sacrifice. And we got to be willing to let go and give and trust God and watch him do things that can only be attributed to him. Never stop letting go. And last but not least... Think big God. Think big God. You're probably wondering why I have this sledgehammer up here. Look at verses 43, 44, and 45. If you don't have these underlined, highlighted, circled, you're missing out on some incredible stuff right here. Look at verse 43. I'll have you fill in some of the blanks, okay? It says, and the Lord... Let's do that again. And the Lord... Gave unto Israel all the which he sware to give unto their fathers, and they possessed it and dwelt therein. Look at verse 44. And the Lord them round about according to all that he sware unto their fathers. And there stood not a man of all their enemies before them. And the Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand. 
Everybody read verse 45 out loud together. There failed not aught of any good thing which the Lord had spoken unto the house of Israel. All came to pass. All came to pass. You know what this is? This is sledgehammer theology. This is the author under divine inspiration from God himself beating and hammering into our heads and into our hearts that God is faithful. The Lord gave the land. The Lord gave them rest. The Lord did all that he promised. All came to pass. All came to pass. Everything that he swore to the fathers, every promise that he ever made, he is faithful. Think big God. That's what we got to think. He is faithful. These were promises that were made hundreds of years in advance. (laughs) These were promises that survived slavery, that outpowered Pharaoh and Egypt's army, that marched through seas on dry ground, that knocked down city walls with earthquake power, that trampled over giants and insurmountable enemies like they were nothing but little grasshoppers. That's who our God is, and that's the power of his faithfulness. God will smash any barrier. God will trample any obstacle to fulfill his word. Do you understand? God wants you to know that he is faithful. He will smash any barrier. He will demolish any obstacle to fulfill his word. God is faithful. He is tenacious in his faithfulness to his people. These verses right here, this is the theological heartbeat of the entire book of Joshua. Joshua is one of the most encouraging books in all of the Bible because this is a generation that actually was faithful, that did obey God, that went and conquered the land, that saw God do exceeding abundantly above anything that they could ever ask or think. And God wants us to understand that when we do let go and when we do understand the big idea that he has for our lives, he will bring all to pass. He is faithful. Never stop finding goodness. That's the practical application. Never stop finding goodness. I know without a shadow of a doubt that there are burdens here this morning. Life is hard. Life is full of challenges. Some of you you in here are facing cancer and some Huge health issues. Some of you in here have been hurt and betrayed in a way that you never could have dreamed could have ever possibly happened or been a part of your life. I'm leaving on Wednesday. I'm getting on a plane and I'm flying to Honduras and I'm going to spend five days with my friends Matt and Delita who are still reeling because their son was killed by a drunk driver just five months ago, four months ago. Life is hard, life is difficult. And there are times when we doubt God. And if you don't believe me, there are times in the Bible where even the greatest giants of the faith, like David, doubted God. Just read the book of Psalms and you will find them questioning God. But you know what we must never do? We must never stop finding his faithfulness and seeing it. Because even this morning, right now, if you open your eyes, his goodness and his mercy is pursuing you. It's following you all the days of your life. It's here today. His presence is here. His strength is here and make no mistake about it he is faithful all that he promises will come to pass all that he promises all that he promises you are a loved child of God and you are just as able to receive his promises as David was and Joshua was and Caleb was and Moses was never stop finding the goodness of God 